Y'all can be seated. Y'all need to stand and watch me do the announcements and prayer time. <laughs> Let me welcome everybody to our Pack a Pew Sunday. If you are visiting with us, we'd love to have a record of that visit. Take your bulletin. Uh, we have a little uh, area on the bottom you can tear off. Tear that off, fill it out, hand it to me, put it in the offering plate as it goes by, or leave it in the pew. We'll collect it. But we just want to thank you for choosing to visit with us today. You could have gone anywhere. But we thank you for coming to Eastside today. Let me let you in on a little secret. We kind of had this day planned for a couple weeks now, a Pack a Pew Sunday. This is the first day in a while that we actually have had a choir. So this is their first day. And so, amen. But I got noticing something. Looking at the choir, the first two rows look phenomenal. We got to work on that back row. <laughs> amen, amen. I'm just kidding. Uh, don't forget, you parents of our elementary age kids, uh, they will be going to uh, Deerwood Farms Pumpkin Patch, not this Wednesday, but a week from Wednesday, October 12th. So be, uh, that'll be in the bulletin next time. So just be aware of that. They'll meet in the FLC at 615. But we do want to thank everybody for coming today. And um, if you don't have a home church, I will not steal nobody from your regular place of worship, worship, but if you don't have a home church, we know a place, and you are more than welcome to come to Eastside to worship. I also invite you back tonight. Uh, we're doing a series on the I Am of what Jesus said he was. Tonight, we're going to talk about the door, and so we have been studying the book of James on Sunday morning. We're going to deflect from James for a while. We're going to talk about an old story we've heard since we were probably this age right here, and that is, uh, we're going to be in the book of Jonah, and it's going to talk about returning to God. And what I want to tell you this morning, no matter what your story is, no matter if you've been out of church a week since Wednesday night, or if you've been out of church 50 years, you can return to God. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, we love you. Lord, I just thank you for being so good to us. Lord, I thank you for these full pews. Lord, I thank you for the faithfulness of the membership. Just go out and invite. And Lord, I pray that every Sunday should be pack a pew Sunday. That we just go out and invite others to church. We see, Lord, that we go out, we invite, they'll come. Lord, I pray that they only come, but they feel comfortable. They feel warm. They feel welcomed. But more importantly, Lord, I pray they feel you. And Lord, I just pray, as we go through this service today, we understand our prayer list, go through the announcements. But the most important thing we do is worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I pray, Lord, you'll bless the, anoint the ones who bring the music, bless the message, hide each one of us behind the cross. And Lord, I just pray for today, as we take a break from James, and we go to the book of Jonah in the Old Testament, Lord, I pray that each one of us, whether we're a church member or whether we're a visitor, we know that we can return to you. Why? Because we know that you're standing there with arms wide open. To welcome us home. And Lord, again, I just pray you'll bless, anoint this service, be with the ones leading the worship. And again, Lord, I pray you'll just bless that most important time, that invitation time. Lord, I pray that hearts and minds will be receptive to the Holy Spirit today. And Lord, I just pray that as we leave here, we're filled up with you to go out and do what you've commanded the church to do. Go out and share you with a lost and dying world. Lord, I thank you for all that you do for us. I thank you for loving us. I thank you for dying on the cross. And I pray this prayer in the most precious and only name there is. And that 
It's the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 First Timothy 1.17 says, Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Stand with us, please, and let's sing together. Lift our voices together. shall praise thy works to another and shall declare their mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. We'll speak of it and we'll also sing of it.
come to you this morning just letting you bless us in every way Lord in song and service and Lord I just pray most of all if there's anyone here this morning that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior that the message they'll hear this morning will bring you uh, their lives and Lord I just thank you so much for everything you do to us all the blessings you give us and Lord I just pray for the service this morning that you've given Pastor Jamie the message we so desperately need to hear we take these tithes and offerings now, Lord, and use them for your service. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.
At this time, I want to ask you all to stand and greet your neighbor. Let them know how glad you are to see them this morning. Amen. I just thought about it. Just let them go ahead and sing some more songs till about 12 o'clock. I'd have just bless my soul just right there instead of y'all having to hear, hear this part. But, but anyway, I do appreciate that hard work. Everybody's put into that, not only from the, from the stage, but also to the sound. It's a lot of hard work getting that choir and that praise team together. So I appreciate you guys getting that ready for uh, today and, and moving forward with that. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter number one. I have, if you're visiting with us, we have five children, and our oldest is married and just had our first grandbaby, and I always kind of slip that in because I'm very proud of that, but we have, that means four at home, and so one of them always comes with me on Sunday morning, and so it's our next oldest daughter named Ava James, and she's 11 years old, but the reason I brought her up, and I told her before service because I didn't want to have her mentioned it to her when I kind of put, this, put together this sermon this week, I did not want her to be all nervous all week that I was actually going to pinpoint her during this po- point in, in the sermon. But, and it fits just perfectly. Um, we've had family movie night in our, in our house for a while now, and that is when we're all at home or have nothing to do or don't have any ball games or we just have a night at home, we will have family movie night. And over the years, that's kinda, it's kind of diminished a little bit. But the reason I bring that up is my 11-year-old daughter, I got to tell you about her favorite movie, okay? It was made in 19, you know, it's not Moana, it's not any Disney princess movie or anything like that. Well, she's too old, she's in the youth group now, because she don't watch that. But I had to get that in before I got in trouble. But she, uh, the movie she likes is not anything made in, you know, really, anytime, it, the movie's 47 years old. The reason I know that is because I'm 47. I was born in May 1975. This movie was the first summer blockbuster in 1975, directed by Steven Spielberg. And you might have guessed it. My 11-year-old daughter's favorite movie is Jaws. <laughs> you like, Pastor, what are y'all doing at your house? Well, just pray for us, okay? <laughs> but her favorite movie is Jaws. Always has been. She's loved it since she first saw it. She's like, well, how are you raising your kids? Well, again, pray for us. But we, it, it fits today because we've heard this story so many times in Jonah. We've heard this story so many times that I think sometimes we get so numb and scarred to it that we don't even think it's real. But let me tell you something, folks. You may be visiting with us and you haven't been to church in a long time or you came last Wednesday night. Whatever the Bible says is true. And we take it literally like it happened yesterday. So if the Bible says Jonah spent three days in the belly of a whale, he spent three days in the belly of a whale. We're not going to water it down here at east side. I don't really know where you worship at, but we, we take it black, white, or red here. If Jesus said it, he spoke it. If Jonah wrote it, if Abraham 
uh, spoke it, if Moses wrote it, that means God entwined, entwined in them and breathed in them the word of God, and we preach it just like that it here. Amen. So now that we've said hello, <laughs> I'm going to have you stand for the reading of God's word. I'm probably going to read some parts of uh, Jonah chapter number one. I'm not going to read it all, and then we'll kind of highlight some things. I'm not going to get through all the book of Jonah. We're just going to get through the majority of chapter 1, and that's kind of where it stops. We're going to stop, really, him in the belly of the well this morning. But I really want you to see how he got there. And that, let me answer a question for you. You can return to God at any moment. Why? He is still calling people by his name. He is still welcoming people home, and he is still saving souls today. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. I talked about this Wednesday night. And my two favorite words in the Bible, other than he forgives, is but God. Verse 3 starts with something else. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, therefore, and went down, down, notice that, down into it. Went down to Joppa, went down into it, the ship, to go with them unto Tarshish. From the presence of the Lord, but the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. Verse 6, so the shipmaster came to him and said, And then what meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us, that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and that lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What, it, what is thine occupation? And hence comest thou. What is thy country? And of what people art thou? Verse 9. And he said unto him, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the Lord God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. So I'm going to ask you today, and I'll get to the rest of this chapter in a few moments in the sermon, but I'm going to ask you today, do you need to return to God? And let me, answer, let me say this for some of you guys. You can return to God. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Lord, thank you for this great crowd. Thank you for that great music. Lord, I pray you'll just bless the, the message that we're about to give here. And Lord, I pray that they don't see any of us anytime we serve you. They see you. And Lord, I pray that my words become your words and my thoughts become your thoughts. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you. And you may be seated. When Jay Leno hosted the Tonight Show, he would have a thing once a week or every two weeks or once a month called Man on the Street where he would do an interview with somebody, just ask them a random question that you would think people would know. Sometimes it would be about geography. Sometimes it would be just a random math question. But Jay Leno asked him one time about questions concerning the Bible. And Jay Leno turned to a young man and asked, who, according to the Bible, was swallowed by a whale? That young man said, Pinocchio. Now you laugh. You laugh, and that's comical, but that's also sad in the same regard. He said, Pinocchio, unfortunately, we'll just go ahead and get this off to a start here. Some in the church are just as clueless about the book of Jonah like that guy was. When we open the book of Jonah, we must ask one, I heard a preacher one time say, is this a tale of a whale or a whale of a tale? Some in our enlightened day think that the story of a fish swallowing a man is simply too amazing to believe. They obviously don't research history. In February 1891, the Star of the East was a, was a whaling ship hunting off the islands in the South Atlantic. And while pursuing a, a large whale, one of the two boats was capsized by this big whale. The hunters went down on to kill the whale, but feared two of them had drowned. James Bartley was one of the missing fishermen. The crew mourned him, and, but they also had a tremendous task of preparing this giant sea monster. They finally called him. They worked until midnight, removing all the innards of that 80-foot-long, 80-ton fish. The next morning, they hoisted the whale's stomach on a deck. To their surprise, they saw faint movement. 
the science editor of the local town, investigated the incident. He verified that James Bartley was still indeed the reason for that movement. Folks, he was still alive in the belly of that whale. And when the stomach was cut open, I know we're about to eat lunch in about 45 minutes, so hang with me. Bartley was found unconscious. He was bathed in seawater and placed in the captain's quarters for two weeks. He was confused and mentally disturbed, yet in four weeks he had fully recovered. For the rest of his life, he carried the scars of a bleached white face, neck and hands from the gastric acids, acids that he had been in for those times. While we have good reason to believe that story, and it's in medical journals all the time, we can't fathom that Jonah, it happened to Jonah. But let's see how he got there. The truth is that we see that he did not want to do what God wanted him to do. Sadly enough, that happens every Sunday morning. That happens all the time. How do you know that, Pastor? Well, go to golf course. Go to the lake. Go to Walmart right now and see the choices that people made. Instead of worshiping at the house of the living God, they chose to walk their own path. And these are the same folks, and you may be, and I will never know your story. I don't know your story until you come tell me. Pastor, I have been church hurt. Been there, done that. I just don't like the hypocrites that are in the church. Eastside has a pastor who's a hypocrite. I just don't like how they act one way in the service and act one way when they get out on the street. Let me let you on a little secret. We all guilty of that. We all do that. I have seen some of the most precious folks worship, hands raising, and they get out of here and they fussing at the people that won't let them out of the parking lot to go on 178. Folks, what is God telling us to do today? What's he telling you? He told Jonah, Jonah, I need you to go preach to that great city of Nineveh. And by the way, folks, let's not forget, he was a popular prophet. He spoke a great message. But then God challenged him to do something that he didn't really want to do. Matter of fact, he runs, you know the rest of the story, you know the rest of the book. He runs from God, ends up where we're going to finish this sermon off at, Goes to Nineveh, and what happens? Gets mad when they get right. Man, if that ain't a Southern Baptist, I don't know what is. You see God move, and you get mad that God moved in the way you didn't want him to. How dare we, folks? It's just the same way of slapping God in the face. God, hey, the Holy Spirit reigns in your life, and, and you're listening to God, and you're in your prayer closet, you're in your devotion, you're, in your, you're in, at God's house, you're with God's people, and God asks you to do something. And you're like, nope, can't do that. It gets me out of my comfort zone. I'm too scared. Can't do it. I ain't doing it. We see it all the time. Do we have a desire to see God move in the church, but we got to grasp this truth, folks, and we'll never see the moving of God collectively until we experience him personally. In our information-based society, we're fixated on indicators, weather indicators, economic indicators, and political indicators. Even our cars have indicator lights. Amazingly, it's the, name, it's the same in Jesus' day. For that matter, he, he chided them for understanding the weather better than the spiritual conditions of that day. As we prepare for revival in a few weeks at, down at Flat Rock, we need to examine our spiritual condition. Matter of fact, we need to do that every day. Where are we at with God today? Where are you at with God today? And take a close look at the backslidden prophet we have in Jonah. And it might re reveal some things that we need to address. So what are those indicators? Number one, we ignore God's word. We see that in verse 1 through 3. Notice the phrase, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. It reminds us that God constantly tries to speak to the hearts of his people. Perhaps we should ask, has God spoken to our heart about any area of our life? Really, it's not a question. I'm going to say this. It's really not a question whether God has spoken. It's really a question, are we listening? Ultimately, we ignore the word that speaks to our heart for two reasons. We don't like what God says or commands. Imagine how Jonah felt when he heard the Spirit say, go to Nineveh. 
go where? He didn't like it at all. Concerning the Bible, someone wisely observed one time, sin will keep you from this book, or this book will keep you from sin. When Christians drift from God, they typically begin right there. They just stop reading, they stop praying, and they stop going. And they stop. Again, I've met a lot of visitors today, and I'm so thankful that you came to worship here at Eastside today. I don't know where you stand with God today. Maybe you worship someplace else and just your neighbor just hammered down on you so much. You're like, I want this guy to shut up. I'm coming to Eastside, okay? <laughs> but Sunday night, I'll be at my church. Well, I thank you for coming. Or maybe you just are mad at God. Maybe there's been a death in your family and you blame God. Well, I hate that. I hate the pain you're going through. But whatever happens in this life, folks, is for your benefit and his glory. That's tough to hear. That's tough to say. But even in the valley, God is good. Even when you can't see him, he's still there. Even when you can't feel him, he's still there. I don't know what Jonah was so afraid of. He had been with God for so long. Listen, folks, this is a good reminder of any one of us. We just stop doing what God asks us to do at any moment. The moment it doesn't comfort us, we're done. We're done. We're done. How faithful are you to God? I'm not talking about your salvation. I'm not talking about that. But how faithful are you to God? More times than not, we set conditions on our faithfulness. Yeah, I know that one's going to get an amen. <laughs> I think I actually see Martin here. You ain't getting an amen right there. But we, we set conditions on our faithfulness. God, we're going to work up until this point. I know you want me to go to that wire right there, but, man, that's a danger zone. I can't do that. That's Nineveh. I ain't going there. I'll stay right here in my comfort zone. Folks, let me say this before I forget. He went to Tarshish on his way instead of going to Nineveh, left Joppa. The closest thing that he could do, it was closer to go to Nineveh. He went the long way away. So folks, the moment you stop doing what God's asked you to do, you're moving yourself away from God, a God who never moves. He's always constant. He's always there. But secondly, we don't love as Love it as we should. God's word is truly a love letter. When we love God, we want to hear from him. Charles Schultz the, provided those helpful and humorous insights through his Peanuts comic strip. He ran one one time about Charlie Brown's sister Sally struggling with her memory verse for Sunday. She was lost in her thoughts trying to figure it out. She said, maybe it has something from that book in the back called Reevaluation. Some of you are like, I thought that's what it was. <laughs> it's revelation. Getting your word, folks. Getting your word. But hey, there's some truth in that. Reevaluation. We have it's a book to reevaluate re our life, see if it matches up with what God wants. We should always read it with the intent of reevaluating our attitudes and actions to make sure they are squaring up with the truth lined up in God's word. Ignoring God's word is an indicator that you need to return to God. When you grabbed your Bible this morning, did you have to dust the dust off from last Sunday? Or did you get into it this week? And man, it's wear and tear. And there's highlighted. Listen, it's okay to write in your Bible. It's okay to highlight in your Bible. It's okay to write your uh, other things in your Bible, your, your, your devotion in your Bible. It's okay when the, when the spine of that Bible to go get it restructured at, at crossway or lifeway or whatever. it's okay to put duct tape on that thing listen use your bible Amen. indicator number two is we harbor hidden sins from the, our past there was a drunken husband who snuck in his house one night went upstairs and he looked in the bedroom and he saw his wife sleeping he went to the bathroom mirror and saw himself and he bandaged it bandaged himself all the bumps and bruises and cuts he had received in a fight at that bar earlier that night he then proceeded to climb into bed smiling as he thought that he had pulled one over on his wife when morning came 
He woke up, and his, his wife was standing above him. She said, honey, you were drunk last night, wasn't you? He said, no, I wasn't. She said, well, if, you're, if you was not the one who was drunk, then who put all the Band-Aids on the bathroom mirror? <laughs> That's going to get me off topic already this morning. Some of y'all ain't going to get that until you're eating at Yanks here in about 45 minutes, okay? You ever tried to hide sin? Maybe you did it years ago. Maybe you've never confessed it or tried to apologize for it. Instead, you, you hope to sweep it underneath the rug or hide it in the closet. Maybe the sin was committed against a loved one or a friend, and maybe it was an act of, of pleasure-seeking. But the issue is you must address its spiritual impact on your relationship with God. Folks, sin keeps us from God. Jonah had harbored a sin from his past. He despised Nineveh. Hated it. He was prejudiced. Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrians. They were inhumane people that scoured the earth. We read that in the book of Nahum, chapter number 3. The Assyrians had a strict take-no-prisoners policy. They were truly barbarians. They would pull the tongues out of their captives, and they would skin them alive. And after they left the city and conquered it, they would leave the skulls of their victims at the city gate to let the world know that the Assyrians had come in and took over. This was a bad, bad group of people. Jonah, the man who, whose name means dove, had gone popular as the prophet that denounced the Assyrians. But now you've got to go face them. And now he feared he would lose credibility with the Israelites if he went to preach the offer to grace to the Assyrians. Red flag. He was looking to find grace with the Israelites instead of trying to find grace with God. See, folks, the message is not popular. I get it. We water it down these days. I don't know where you go, and I pray you go to a Bible-believing, a preacher who brings it every Sunday, who tells you the truth, that sin, if that calls it sin, it is sin. And then we don't water it down. But I'm afraid, folks, sometimes it gets watered down. You know why it gets watered down? Let me let you know a little secret. It gets watered down so it's more attractive to people to come in because, man, they, they, they like sin at Esau. They want, because we lighten the load on sin, that means more people. That means, oh, and the music's great here. We saw that this morning. Listen, but we're going to sing about the blood. We're going to preach about the blood. But we lighten the load on sin, and it's just like, well, if, if we lighten it and we water it down a little bit, people will come, and that means ties are up, and we can do more ministries around here. Folks, if we do our job as leaders of this church and you do your job as being obedient to God and being faithful to Him, your tithe should be in anyway, by the way. And I just threw that in there. But we don't do that. He didn't want to preach that message. Listen, folks, sometimes the message is glorious that we get to preach, but sometimes it is hard. It is hard to save from here. But pastors have to give an account before God, and I want God to say, Hey, Jamie, you were faithful to my word. That I breathed into folks. But his hidden sin had come back to haunt him. That's right. That's right, you Ninevites, you evil people. Oh, I got to go there now? Oh, man. No, I'm going that way. You harbor sin, this indicates you need to return to God. His hidden sin had come back to haunt him. And it became an excuse for his rebellion against God. We should all remember Numbers 32, 23. Be sure your sin will find you out. Indicator number three is we neglect our evangelistic responsibility. We see that in verse 2. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. God told Jonah to go preach against Nineveh. Most people know that they were, Israelites were God's chosen people. But a question arises, well, you ever thought what they were chosen to do? We as Christians, we as the church of the living God, we're called. What are we called to do? May have to help me out here, folks. 
but sometimes it gets blended. We're called to have the best fall festival in Pickens County. Nope. We're called to have a pack of pew Sunday, October 2nd, and invite everybody we can. It's not it. It's great, though. That's a start. And those are opportunities for evangelism. It's to tell a lost and dying world about a man named Jesus who came to save. They were chosen to take the knowledge of God to the nations. When God called Abraham to become the father of his people, the Lord told the patriarch, out of your seed will the nations be blessed. God entrusted evangelism to his people. And now the church, now the church in 2022 is under the great commission of our Lord. We have the responsibility to carry the gospel to the world. We are his people. We are his church. And he entrusts us to send out his message. But we're sharing, are, are we sharing our faith? The story illustrates the redemptive work of God in the world. We see that in the book of Jonah. God, he loves the world and sends us to them. The love of God is available to the wicked and vile as well as the self-righteous. Then we see Nineveh. The Assyrians represent the unconverted that desperately need to know both God's love and their impending judgment. Then we see Jonah, the prophet, represents the one sent to share God's love. He was glad to speak for God to the good people, but he refused to speak to those that appeared to, to need the gospel the most. I'm sure Miss Anita right here, Brother Wayne, it's probably easy to speak at sometimes maybe a pastor's conference. You know, you're speaking with other pastors. But sometimes you're bringing a message to a congregation that you don't know. He's in revival this morning. Pray for Brother Wayne up at Nine Forks in Dakinsville. He don't know the crowd. We never assume. I pray everybody in here is saved as can be. I pray that. I pray that this morning in my office. Some of y'all, I don't know. I don't know your stance with God. But the reason for this message today is that you can return to God today. October 2nd may go down at Pack a Pew Sunday here at Eastside, but October 2nd, 2022 can be your spiritual birthday if you listen to the Holy Spirit. Our indifference to the lost is an indicator that we need to return to God. Our indifference to the lost. Do we care that people die and go to hell? But, by the way, hell's real. Hell is real. You leave this life never doing anything with Jesus but denying him, you will end up in hell by your own accord. Then we see we... Indicator number four, we decide to di deliberately disobey God. Verse three, well, how does it start? Does it start by saying, but God? Nope. But Jonah. Oh, I got an itinerary. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to do this. Jonah knew exactly what God required. However, instead of listening, he decided to willfully disobey. Disobedience is a gentle word for rebellion. For some reason, we've come to believe that God is willing to bargain with us over his commands. We tend to think that it's reasonable for God to make exceptions to his rules or at least compromise his expectations. That's not my God. He does not compromise with our comfort level. And folks, we need to realize if God calls you to do something, whether it's to get saved and go back to your home church tonight and walk forward there and get baptized there, that is what God's called you to do. If God calls you to join Eastside, if God calls you to come get your baptism on the right side of your conversion, don't lower the expectations because your pride or embarrassment stands in the way. God does not negotiate his commands. He didn't for Abraham, Moses, or David, and he won't for us. Again, not popular. That's the truth. If you testify, I believe in God, but then qualify it with however, then you need a return to God. Then we see a run from his calling. We see that in verse 3. Jonah got up to flee from the Lord. Those words are even more stark when we remember that Jonah was a prophet of God. Notice to flee is the irresponsibility of running from God. Where's Deacon at? I'm going to pick up my kids today. Deacon, about to turn 17 this week, okay? When he was little, when he was smaller, 
I, I know what time it is. I'm getting there. When he was smaller and he was acting up, acting a fool somewhere, I'd say, Deacon. And, you, and I would be back here and I'd say, Deacon. And he would kind of, he'd stop. But he kind of still be in slow motion. And I'd see that head cock to where he heard me. And then, of course, I got Deacon. And he'd stop a little longer. He'd pause a little bit. And then he'd keep on going. And then finally, I'd say, Deacon. And he'd say, Sir, I didn't hear you. <laughs> Daddy, why are you screaming at me? You know what? He heard me the entire time. He just ignored me. That's what we do with God. Hey, so-and-so, I need you to do this. No, nah, that's indigestion. He ain't talking to me. That's not the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I, hey, sir, ma'am, I need you to do this. Uh, Holy Spirit, you know, not giving. And all of a sudden, you're like so far away from God, you can't even hear the Holy Spirit no more. Folks, when the Holy Spirit calls, don't get embarrassed. Don't let your pride get in the way. You listen to it. You run to God. Tarsus means it, it, it's the insanity of running from God. Where's your Tarsus? What are you running to instead of running to God this morning? We're running to something. Is it drugs? Is it alcohol? Is it pornography? Is it somebody else in your life you shouldn't be with? Is it a hobby that's taking you away from God? Is it a secret sin that you're doing? Is it a gossip? Maybe being a covet? Is it something that's keeping you from God? Listen, put it at the altar today, and you run back to those holy arms of our God today. Can you truly escape your Tarshish, sir? Yes, you can. God loves you that much. He can redeem you today. You know, I heard God's call to ministry in Kentucky on a, choir tri- on a youth choir trip. Four years ago. And just like John, God's came a, a, a time. And, but what's he calling you today to do? It may not be a pastor. It may not be a missionary. Is God telling you to talk to that lost person at your job? But it may cause you to lose your job? What do we do? I met a man in a soccer game today. I've known him for years. His name's Terry. Terry... I used to go to our previous place for worship. Terry was a chemical engineer. Made six figures at a plant. Chemical engineer. When I say six figures, that first one didn't start with one. That first one started with six. He got scolded for witnessing to people at his job. Can't do that anymore, you're going to get fired. I'm going to keep witnessing. Can't do that anymore, you're going to get fired. We're going to let you go, you keep witnessing. You know what happened? Terry kept witnessing. Terry lost his job. You're like, how stupid is that moron to lose a six-figure income? He was being real with God and being everything God wanted him to be. What his Tarshish could have been was the love of money and for the love of being comfortable. Folks, nowhere in my gospel, nowhere in my Bible does it say serving God means we have to be comfortable. He calls some people to Cambodia that we know of, to be missionaries, that sleep on mats, that you have to have somebody in your tent to stay up one night, every night, one person's got to stay up for the cobras that come in to the tent. Well, sign me up. (laughs) Y'all know me and wildlife. Praying that God don't call this pastor to Cambodia. Because I'll be on a one-way medevac flight back from getting bit. i tell you that right now. But we disagree. And, and finally, what are you running from? Well, I just haven't been to church in a while. I don't know what to do. What to do? Did you see an activity list where we have we got to do 25 jumping jacks? Then we're going to take a blood test. And all you AB positive people sit over here. What do I do? You sit down and you worship. We don't pass out a test. I'm not going to have a pop quiz here in a few moments on what I said, even though I should. (laughs) We disregard, finally, God's correction. In the midst of God, a God-sent storm, Jonah had fallen into a deep sleep. His sleep is a good metaphor for spiritual indifference. He had gotten comfortable. He was so far away from God, 
He could sleep at night. I battled insomnia for how long? My wife's right here. How long? Years. Until I answered the call to ministry. Craziest thing. I'm talking when, oh, Pastor, you probably got sleep. I would go lay down at 11, 1130, look at her and go, not tonight. Be up till 5, doze off, get up at 6.30 and go work my job. Weeks at a time. But, which means I was kind of indifferent. I was running. I was chasing a dollar instead of chasing what God wanted me to do as a pastor. Had a great job. This is more fulfilling. This is what God's called me to do. And so, now... I sleep like a baby. Now, when you think I don't sleep like a, I don't wake up every two hours to be fed and wet my diaper, but you know, <laughs> I sleep all night long. <laughs> Y'all done messed me up this morning. Come on now. <laughs> so, how do you return to God? How do you do that? John Newton discovered grace and forgiveness through humility, honesty, and confession. Newton signed on with a slave ship leaving from Africa with its cargo, if you will. He was an experienced sailor, navigator, but he cussed and blasphemed, and even the, he turned the, the heart, most hardest sailor's ears red with his vile language. The ship was caught in a horrible storm, and he was taken on water. The crew had to pump 24 hours a day to stay afloat, but the constant wind rocked the boat so dangerously that the sailors had to tie themselves to the deck to keep from being swept overboard. At one point, several of the crew tried to throw Newton overboard. They figured that God was punishing him like Jonah in the Old Testament. The captain declared that the only way the ship would make it to the safe harbor was by God's power. He commanded everyone, including Newton, to pray, God, if you're the one, if you're the one true God, Newton prayed loudly that everybody heard, make, your, make good your word and cleanse my vile heart. After four weeks of storms and constant brushes with death, that ship limped into a port in an Irish town. John Newton, former free thinker, former slave trader, former atheist, declared, in fact, his faith in Jesus. You may not know the name, but you know his song he wrote. Am I know it? Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. Which it truly it is. You ever notice that some things that other religions talk about, whether they're Islam or Muslim or anything like that, they don't talk, they don't use adjective words to describe what their God has. What does our God have? Amazing grace, precious blood, live in sacrifice. Look who he is. Look what he did to you, for you. What's he calling you to do today? He may be calling you, hey, we need some help in the nursery. We do. We need some help in children's church, and we do. He may be telling you, hey, they need some more candy for the fall festival, and we do. What's God calling you? Where's your Nineveh at? And why are you not running to where God wants you? Why are you running away from Nineveh, headed to Tarshish? Going down, going down, going down, down which means moral failure in the Bible. Why do you keep going down when God can lift you up today? Would you please stand and bow your head and close your eyes? Nobody looking around. I know what time it is. We're not going to drag this out. But I want to go as long as the Holy Spirit speaks this morning. Maybe you 